poems have given rise to as much discussion and debate as Kubla Khan. A lot of that discussion revolves around issues arising from Coleridge's preface to the poem, so I'll start with that before moving on to the poem itself. Kubla Khan was published in 1816, together with two other poems by Coleridge, Christabel and The Pains of Sleep. The poet, referring to himself in the third person as the author, says he's publishing it at the request of a poet of great and deserved celebrity, whom we know from Lee Hunt's account of the occasion to be Lord Byron, to whom Coleridge had read Kubla Khan in April 1816. So far, so good. He then goes on to say that he is publishing the poem as a psychological curiosity, rather than for any supposed poetic merits. That raises a major question. What exactly is Kubla Khan? In what sense is it a psychological curiosity? I'll come back to that question later on. First, I'd like to look at what Coleridge says about the circumstances in which the poem was written. He dates its composition to the summer of the year 1797. Uh, this is the first of several conflicting, confusing and questionable statements that Coleridge makes about the poem. The original manuscript has not survived, but he made a fair copy known as the Crewe Manuscript, in which he gives the date of composition as the fall of the year 1797. And his grandson, Ernest Hartley Coleridge, citing evidence from Coleridge's letters, concludes that the poem must actually have been composed in May 1798. October 1797 is the date most Coleridge scholars accept as being correct. The general consensus is that during the second week of October 1797, while walking from Linton to his home in Nether Stowey, Coleridge was taken ill with a stomach upset and stopped over, probably at Ash Farm but possibly at Broom Street Farm, both of which are near the village of Culbone, and it was there that the poem was written. It doesn't much matter, I suppose, exactly when or where Coleridge wrote Kubla Khan. He was, as he goes on to say, stoned out of his skull, having taken an anodyne, which in the Crewe manuscript he specifies as two grains of opium taken to check a dysentery. And the best part of two decades had gone by between writing the poem and publishing it. It's not surprising that he's a bit vague about the details of it all. But it does cast a bit of doubt on Coleridge's reliability. Doubt which intensifies as we read on. He says that after taking the opium, he was reading Purchase's Pilgrimage, which is incorrect. The passage he goes on to paraphrase actually comes from the fourth volume of Purchase's Pilgrims a different work by the same author. Again, that's a very forgivable confusion, but the passage, as Coleridge cites it in the preface, is another matter. He renders it as beginning, Here the Khan Kubler commanded a palace to be built, which is very different from what Purchase actually wrote. The opening lines of the poem are, in Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, and the source text reads, In Xanadu did Kubla Khan build a stately palace. Coleridge was clearly more indebted to purchase than he gives us to believe in the preface. There are limits to how much one can make allowances for Coleridge's faulty memory here. Purchase's Pilgrims is a weighty tome, and, as Norman Fruman says, it seems unlikely that Coleridge would have carried it while making a long journey on foot, nor is it a book one would expect to find in an isolated farmhouse. Could Coleridge's account of the poem's conception be an elaborate fiction? In addition to the inconsistencies between the published preface and the handwritten account of the poem's creation in the Crewe manuscript, there are several small but significant differences between the Crewe manuscript version of the poem and the version that was finally published. 
Could it be that there were other earlier versions, now lost, in which Coleridge polished and refined whatever he wrote after his opium dream? The suspicion that this may be so is strengthened by the degree of intertextuality between Kubla Khan and other works. There are echoes of Charles Lamb's A Vision of Repentance, a copy of which Lamb gave to Coleridge in April 1797, as well as of Milton's Paradise Lost, Johnson's Rasselas, and numerous other works, from the Book of Revelation to A Midsummer Night's Dream. Can Kubla Khan really be a psychological curiosity, a spontaneous opium-induced outpouring of the poet's imagination? The author continued for about three hours in a profound sleep, at least of the external senses, during which time he has the most vivid confidence that he could not have composed less than from two to three hundred lines, if that indeed can be called composition, in which all the images rose up before him as things, with a parallel production of the correspondent expressions, without any sensation or consciousness of effort. In 1818, just two years after Kubla Khan was published, the novelist and poet Thomas Love Peacock wrote, It is extremely probable that Mr. Coleridge, being a very visionary gentleman, has somewhat deceived himself respecting the origin of Kubla Khan and uh, the story of its having been composed in his sleep must necessarily, by all who are acquainted with his manner of narrating matter of fact, be received with a certain degree of scepticism. So much cause for doubt here, and we haven't even got to the person from Porlock yet. At this moment, he was unfortunately called out by a person on business from Porlock and detained by him above an hour, and on his return to his room found, to his no small surprise and mortification, that though he still retained some vague and dim recollection of the general purport of the vision, yet, with the exception of some eight or ten scattered lines and images, all the rest had passed away. Why is it that so many of the famous historical events I was taught at school turn out to be apocryphal? As far as is known, Marie Antoinette never said, let them eat cake, King Harold wasn't killed by an arrow in his eye, and King Arthur never burned the cakes. And there never was any person on business from Porlock interrupting Coleridge in his writing of Kubla Khan. At least, that's what Elizabeth Schneider and quite a few other Coleridge scholars have argued. We could take the view that none of that matters, that what matters is the poem itself and how it speaks to us, and up to a point, I agree. But if we take it as a spontaneous outpouring of the poet's unconscious, as Coleridge would have us believe, it will inevitably speak to us differently from the way it speaks if we see it as something that is consciously contrived. From that point of view, it does matter whether Coleridge's account of the circumstances surrounding the creation of the poem is fact or fiction. I'm inclined to think it's neither entirely fact nor entirely fiction. I'll settle for calling the preface an embellished account of what really happened. We'll never be 100% sure of how much is embellished and how much is real, but one thing I think is clear. The preface, the context and setting for the poem's creation, is as much a part of Kubla Khan as the poem itself. And we can't ignore it if we want to get an understanding of what this poem is all about. <laughs>